The Tom Woods Show, episode 2150. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. I'm giving away three free courses from my Liberty Classroom. One of them is ex-Marxist Michael Rechtenwald teaching you about critical theory so you can understand leftism and fight it better, as well as our course on how Alexander Hamilton screwed up America and the history of the conservative and libertarian movements. Check it out at 3freecourses.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Well, we are going to talk about the Federal Reserve System today, because why not? The times seem to call for it. I'm not going to go into the technical stuff of how the Fed operates and open market operations and the purchases it makes and stuff like that. That technical stuff is an episode in itself, and we have actually covered that in the past on the show. But for people who want to know those details, I'll refer you to a couple of places. One, and I'll link to both of these on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2150, is Rothbard's The Case Against the Fed, Murray Rothbard, The Case Against the Fed. But the other one, is a more recent book. Now, I haven't read this book yet, but it's on my list and I intend to get to it in the relatively near future. And that is a book by my old colleague, Bob Murphy, that was just released called Understanding Money Mechanics. And he really does focus in on a lot of these kinds of questions. So the mechanical stuff, I'll refer you to that. But the broader questions about the Federal Reserve are what I want to cover today. So I think the best way to talk about the Federal Reserve is to say that it is the American Central Bank And it enjoys a government-granted monopoly on the creation of legal tender money. Now, there are some people who, for some reason, want to focus on claiming that the Fed is a private corporation or something. It's a private company. And isn't it terrible that a private company is in charge of our money? I don't go for this line of analysis at all. For one thing, it makes it sound like the problem with the Fed is that it's not socialistic enough. You know, it would be much better if we had a flat-out government agency running the money. I, I don't understand this critique at all. It's wrong-headed. It's not the way to go. Not to mention, it's a very strange private company whose chair and the board of which are chosen by the U.S. government. And then secondly, it's a very strange private company that had to be created by an act of Congress. And it's a strange private company that could function only with the government-granted monopoly that it has. Okay, so at the very least, we have to admit that this is a very, very peculiar, quote-unquote, private company. So to focus on that aspect of it is to focus on the least interesting part. The most interesting part is that it enjoys a government-granted monopoly. And let's talk about the nature of that monopoly and what it allows it to do. So as time went on, the scope of what the Fed was expected to do broadened. And we began to get, as economics developed, and not in a good way, we began to get this claim that really what the job of the Fed was, was to smooth out the economy, because it was thought that these couple of things needed to be balanced. Price inflation on the one hand, and employment and output on the other. So that's what the Fed is supposed to do. It's supposed to give us a smooth economy that keeps price inflation as low as it can keep it without giving us too much unemployment. So again, there's this crazy idea I talked about in my newsletter of the Phillips curve that some people genuinely thought that there was a trade-off between unemployment and inflation. You can have low inflation, but you're going to have high unemployment and vice versa. These are some of the crazy things Keynesians have been led to believe. There's nothing to it. It's been empirically refuted and it makes no theoretical sense. So anyway, the Fed has to be, as Rothbard put it, the great helmsman that's going to steer the economy through turbulent times. And even in ordinary times, it's going to keep things on an even keel by pumping in just the right amount of money here and there. I mean, it's supposed to have a veneer of, let's say, scientific sophistication, let's say, but it doesn't. When you look at it closely, you say, these people are just quacks, right? They they got a degree in something and now they want to exercise power. But The claims they make for what it is that they think they're able to do are over the top unreasonable, let's say. You'll also hear it said that the Fed was designed to give the United States a flexible currency. Doesn't that sound nice, flexible? Because you don't want to be rigid. You want to be flexible, right, to adapt to the times. Now, what that means in practice, really, is a currency that can be inflated to suit the needs of the government and various financial institutions. That's, quote, flexible. 
And then two, we have chairman of the Fed who boast of their ability to predict economic crises and potentially to prevent them or mitigate them. And so for a long time, people just went along with this or really weren't very much aware of it because the Fed operated really in the shadows. Yeah, you'd have news about it in the financial press, but there was no actual public debate about it. And the general public to this day really has no idea what it is. In fact, I think there was an episode of The Simpsons where Homer refers to, I think he refers to the chairman of the Fed or whatever, and then he says, whatever that is. That's funny because nobody knows what it is. And that's, of course, apparently the way they like it. If an institution exists for 100 years and people still don't know what it does, that's not an accident. Now, it's true the dollar has lost probably at this point, not just 95%, but considerably more of its value since December 1913 when the Fed opened its doors. It had held its value intact pretty much since the founding of the Republic. You can look at that and see, we have pretty good charts on this, what a dollar was able to buy. And it was pretty stable. In fact, prices generally fell during peacetime during U.S. history up until the creation of the Fed and and really until probably a little bit later. But then it starts to fall quite precipitously. Now, when you complain about the Fed or, heaven forbid, you say we should end the Fed, What you usually get is a lecture about how volatile the economy used to be before we had a Fed and how much better it is now and what do you want to go back to those terrible old times. And we have these good times thanks to the wise oversight of our central bank. But it turns out that fairly recent research, let's say over the past 10, 15, 20 years, has thrown a lot of cold water on that. So let's take, for example, the work of Christina Romer, who's an interesting person to cite because She chaired the Council of Economic Advisors under Barack Obama, so you can't accuse her of being a free market ideologue. And she has written that the numbers and the dating that have been used by the National Bureau of Economic Research, and by the way, that's the largest economics research organization in the United States, founded in 1920. These numbers and this dating exaggerate both the number and the length of the economic downturns before we had the Fed. And so the NBER thereby overestimates the Fed's contribution to economic stability because it made these downturns before the Fed seem worse and longer than they actually were. And it turns out, she says, that recessions were in fact not more frequent in the pre-Fed than the post-Fed period. But what if we just compare the period from World War II to the period before the Fed? And so we're just going to exclude the Great Depression entirely. Let's be real sports, you know, because the Great Depression, we all know, was just practice. So let's be real sports and pretend that never happened and not have to credit the Great Depression to the Fed. So in that case, we do find economic contractions to be somewhat more frequent in the period before the Fed. But as George Selgin puts it, they were also almost three months shorter on average and no more severe. Recoveries were also faster in the pre-Fed period, with the average time peak to bottom taking only 7.7 months as opposed to the 10.6 months of the post-World War II period. And then if we extend our pre-Fed period to include 1796 to 1915, economist Joseph Davis finds no appreciable difference between the length and duration of recessions as compared to the period of the Fed. All right, but what about stability? Maybe the Fed has helped stabilize real output. Real output is the total amount of goods and services an economy produces in a given period of time adjusted to remove the effects of inflation. So maybe the Fed has helped to reduce economic volatility. But even that's not so. We've got recent research that finds the two periods, before the Fed and after the Fed, to be approximately equal in volatility, And some finds the post-Fed period, in fact, to be more volatile once faulty data are corrected for. So the ups and downs in output that did exist before the creation of the Fed were not attributable to the lack of a central bank. Before the Fed, output volatility was caused almost entirely by supply shocks of the kind that tend to affect an agricultural society, so harvest failures and such. While output volatility after the Fed is to a much greater extent the fault of the monetary system. Now, I'm citing a whole bunch of studies here, but if you want to see those studies, if you want the references, then I recommend getting my ebook, Our Enemy, the Fed, which you can download at 
ourenemythefed.com, then just skip to the end notes at the end, and you'll see all the references, which is also a good place to look for further reading for those of you who want to know a lot more. Now, when we look back at the 19th century, what we discover is that the monetary and banking instability that we hear so much about and what monetary and banking instability really did exist then were not caused by the absence of a government-established agency issuing unbacked paper money. Richard Timberlake is a well-known economist and historian of American monetary and banking history. He says this, as monetary histories confirm, most of the monetary turbulence bank panics and suspensions in the 19th century resulted from excessive issues of legal tender paper money. And they were abated by the working gold standards of the time. So that's about the opposite of what we're told. So in a nutshell, this is just another example of the faults of interventionism being blamed on the free market. So here are a couple examples of this. The Panic of 1819, which Murray Rothbard wrote a book about called The Panic of 1819, was the result of years of artificial credit creation by the banks, including the newly chartered Second Bank of the United States, which was established in 1817. So that is to say, the banks issued far more paper money than they had gold to back it in their vaults. And as often happens when the country is flooded with money created out of thin air, speculation of all kinds grew intense, as eyewitness testimony abundantly records. The country was on a sugar high, based not on real savings, but on mere paper. During the years when the U.S. had no central bank, so the period from 1811, when the charter of the first bank of the United States expired, and 1817, government had granted private banks the privilege of expanding credit while refusing to pay depositors who were demanding their funds. So in other words, when people came to demand their money from the banks, the banks were allowed to tell them they didn't have the money and that depositors would just have to wait a couple of years. And at the same time, the bank was allowed to continue in operation. By early 1817, the Madison administration finally required the banks to meet depositor demands, but at the same time, chartered the second bank of the United States, which would itself be inflationary. And that bank subsequently presided over an inflationary boom, which came to grief in 1819. Now, the lesson of that sorry episode, which is, by the way, that the economy gets taken on a wild and unhealthy ride when the money supply is dramatically increased and then suddenly reduced, that lesson was so obvious that even the political class managed to figure it out. So for instance, we can find numerous American statesmen who had believed in hard money, had believed in real honest money where you you didn't have to worry, well, they created too much of it and now if I go back to try and get my gold, I can't get... People who favored actually honest money felt confirmed in those views by the events of the panic. So Thomas Jefferson, for example, asked a friend in the Virginia legislature to introduce his plan for reducing the circulating medium, which he had written up in response to the Panic of 1819. The plan sought to withdraw all paper money that had been issued in excess of specie to back it, specie being the precious metal money. Because the idea is that the paper money is supposed to be a stand-in for the metal so that it's just more convenient, and then you can take it to the bank and just trade it in for your precious metals. But it becomes hard to do that if they've issued more paper than they have metals. So he was saying, we've got to withdraw all the, what Mises would call the fiduciary media, the paper money that exists over and above specie backing it. So the plan was looking to withdraw all that paper money in excess of specie over a five-year period, then redeem the rest in specie, and then just have precious metal coins exclusively circulating from that moment on. I have numerous other examples of this. I have people who were converted to hard money because of the Panic of 1819. You can read about them in the ebook Our Enemy, the Fed. Now, for a long time, the Panic of 1873 was held up as an example. Look at how terrible the Panic of 1873 was. If only we'd had the Fed. The Panic of 1873 was said to have inaugurated the so-called Long Depression, which in the more sober accounts lasted until 1879 and in the more outlandish ones, was said to have lasted until 1896. But the modern consensus is that there was, in fact, no long depression after all. So here's even the New York Times, which never admits anything, admitting this. This is the New York Times. Recent detailed reconstructions of 19th century data by economic historians show that there was no 1870s depression. Aside from a short recession in 1873, in fact, the decade saw possibly the fastest sustained growth in American history. Employment grew strongly, faster than the rate of immigration, 
consumption of food and other goods rose across the board. On a per capita basis, almost all output measures were up spectacularly. By the end of the decade, people were better housed, better clothed, and lived on bigger farms. Department stores were popping up, even in medium-sized cities. America was transforming into the world's first mass consumer society. So, how about that? Not to mention farmers who panicked at falling prices for agricultural commodities at first failed to note that other prices were falling even faster. So the terms of trade for American farmers improved considerably during the 1870s. So what was the problem here? Why did we get this so wrong? Historians who know notoriously little about economics seem to have been fooled by the statistics on consumer prices, which fell an average of 3.8% per year. Now remember, the conventional wisdom says that consistently falling prices will cause the earth to break free of its axis and go tumbling toward the sun, so they concluded that this must have been a time of terrible depression. Now, with the gold standard restored in 1879 after being abandoned during the Civil War, the 1880s were likewise a period of great prosperity. Real wages rose by 20% in that decade. Now, the argument that the U.S. economy was susceptible to panics if it didn't have the wise custodianship of a central bank, we can also just dismantle that another way. In the 19th century, nearly all American states had a regulation called unit banking, and that limited banks to a single office, so you couldn't have branch banking, which we have now. You couldn't have intrastate or interstate branch banking. Now, that means that you have a very fragile and undiversified banking system because the bank could be brought to ruin if local conditions turn sour because you have only the one bank and it's invested in entirely local things because it doesn't have branches. And so, yeah, you have artificial instability. Whereas you didn't have any of these panics in Canada, which had no unit banking laws. So how about that? Nobody tells you that. So the bank panics, by the way, that struck the U.S., between the Civil War and World War I occurred either during the spring planting season or the fall harvest, and they were closely connected to the cycle of cotton production. And that's no coincidence. Those are the times when bank lending and leverage are at their peak, and so the banks are the most vulnerable to shifts in depositor confidence and the likelihood of withdrawals from panicky depositors. So in other words, with bank capital constant, but the amount of loans increasing, bank leverage grows. And those depositors who are most concerned about the riskiness of their bank's activities are at that moment most likely to take their money out and thereby making the bank's condition more fragile. So the Fed supplied banks with a source of, quote, liquidity during moments of temporary but intense depositor pressure like these. So am I saying the Fed is therefore the great savior? Well, only if we forget two things. First, other countries, as I said, which had not crippled their banking systems with unit banking laws had been safe from these panics all along. So again, Canada had fractional reserve banking like the U.S., but no unit banking laws. They had no central bank, but also no financial turmoil that we saw in the American bank panics. Bank of Canada wasn't established till 1934, so Canada managed to avoid all this without a central bank. Milton Friedman was fond of pointing out that although the Great Depression claimed over 9,000 American banks, the number of banks that failed in Canada at that time was zero. So it turns out that American bank panics were in large part the result of government intervention in the first place. So how about that? Less regulation, more stability. Second, it's not entirely clear that the Fed was particularly successful in stopping bank panics. Bank panics are phenomenon that came to an end really only with the advent of deposit insurance in 1934. So for example, Andrew Jalil of the University of California at Berkeley concluded in a 2009 study that these are his words. Contrary to the conventional wisdom, there is no evidence of a decline in the frequency of panics during the first 15 years of the existence of the Federal Reserve. Then in a 2000 book called Banking Panics of the Gilded Age, Elmas Wicker says, there were no more than three major banking panics between 1873 and 1907, inclusive, and two incipient banking panics in 1884 and 1890. 12 years elapsed between the Panic of 1861 and the Panic of 1873, 20 years between the Panics of 1873 and 1893, and 14 years between 1893 and 1907, three banking panics in half a century. And in only one of the three, 1893, did the number of bank suspensions match those of the Great Depression. 
By contrast, there were five separate bank panics in just the first three years of the Great Depression alone. Now, even during these pre-Fed panics, the bank failure rate was small, as were the losses that depositors suffered. Depositor losses amounted to 0.1% of GDP during the Panic of 1893, and that was the worst of them all with respect to bank failures and depositor losses. But by contrast, in just the few decades after 1980, the world saw 20 banking crises that led to depositor losses in excess of 10% of GDP and half of them in excess of 20% of GDP. So contrary to popular belief, the age of central banking has not, in fact, given us a world with fewer banking crises. If we define a crisis as a wave of bank failures associated with large losses. So we count four such crises between 1874 and 1913. So you have Argentina, 1890, Australia, 1893, Italy, 1893, and Norway, 1900. Now, by the way, you know what's interesting about each of these countries? Each of them had a boom and a bust in real estate, which had been subsidized by those governments. It was done in ways meant to evade market discipline, put it that way. So a familiar story. Between 1978 and 2008, on the other hand, there were 140 banking crises, 20 of which were worse than the two worst from the earlier period, Argentina and Australia. So there's been a lot of revising of the history of the Fed in light of sounder data and research. But just as important as that is increased scrutiny about what the Fed is doing right here and now. So the Fed has been criticized for bringing about ever higher prices and, of course, correctly criticized for that. An artificial increase in the supply of money tends to push prices higher than they would have been otherwise. But inflation is actually worse than people think, because sometimes we read criticisms of price inflation, and it's all about people on fixed incomes and they can't afford to buy things, and that is indeed bad. So, you know, if your income consists of $1,000 a month and that's all you get forever, and the prices of the goods you buy double, then your purchasing power is cut in half. You know, there's no getting around that. But the problems of inflation are actually worse than just that. So first of all, we have the injustice of so-called redistribution or cantillon effects. And this is the process whereby the government or its privileged central bank creates money, but in that process, it inevitably enriches certain groups at the expense of others. And those certain groups are politically well-connected groups. So for example, the Fed creates money. It doesn't distribute that new money by flying in a helicopter and dropping it proportionately on everybody. Instead, the new money enters the economy at particular points. So whoever gets that money first gets to spend it before prices have yet risen. So you just get stuff that probably you shouldn't have been able to get. Meanwhile, it takes a while for that new money to make its way all through the economy. And by the time it reaches the last person, well, that last person has been paying the higher prices caused by the increased money all that time, but without any of that new money in his possession to offset it. And so there are basically politically connected winners and losers. So who gets the new money first? Well, banks, businesses that have government contracts, investment banks that sell government bonds to the Federal Reserve, things like that. So maybe you notice a pattern there. Or how about this? All known cases of hyperinflation, which is sometimes defined as a 50% or higher rise in the price level per month, have occurred under a system of paper money. And by the way, the consequences of hyperinflation are not just economic. The economic consequences are bad enough. Frugal and provident people watch the value of their savings vanish into thin air. That's pretty bad. But it has consequences that are social, political, cultural, even spiritual. There's a great chapter on this in Guido Holtzman's book, The Ethics of Money Production, another excellent, excellent book on this subject. Inflation at any level has these kinds of effects. Savings and thrift seem less desirable when money is going to lose its value over time. It makes more sense to just spend right now while its value is at its height before it loses still more value. So old-fashioned moral advice that you know your grandparents may have given you about thrift and providing for the future seems stupid and backward to an inflationary generation. Now, governments, here's an important lesson, that have a monopoly on the issuance of money have had a bad habit of debasing and destroying that money. And that habit has had ill effects that have grown all the more as governments have moved away from the old precious metal money and into paper money whose value they can more readily manipulate. So how about this? From 1066 to the early 17th century, 
the English silver pound was debased by one-third for a depreciation factor of 0.3. Over the next 200 years, with the rise of modern banking, the supply increased by a factor of 16. Hmm. But in just the 30 years from 1973 to 2003, the U.S. money supply, M1, increased by a factor of five in just 30 years. So with a record like that, of course, prices have fluctuated considerably, especially when you compare them to the relative stability they had under the gold standard of the 19th century. So the Swiss economist Peter Bernholtz says, a study of about 30 currencies shows that there has not been a single case of a currency freely manipulated by its government or central bank since 1700 that enjoyed price stability for at least 30 years running. Well, how about that? Now, if indeed private companies were in charge of the monies of the world and produced that outcome, we would never hear the end of how exploitative private companies are. And yet the progressive left can't even bring itself to say the words Federal Reserve. All right, folks, I interrupt this tale of villainy to give you a piece of advice. If you are a business owner and you are getting buried by your competition online, then the solution is build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. Or what if you're a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry? You can increase your visibility with Persist SEO. If you hate cold calling, use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? Then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. And if you're not showing up for your services on the major search engines, then get found with the expert search engine optimization of Persist SEO. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736, or ineedseo.help. All right, folks, the very existence of a monopoly producer of legal tender paper money fosters moral hazard. Now, you know what moral hazard is. When you don't bear the costs of something, you're going to be more reckless with that thing. So we might say, I've given the example of a rental car. With a rental car, I mean, it's true, you don't necessarily drive the rental car into the ground. You are definitely not worrying about how many miles you put on that thing. You're not worried about that. It's not your problem because you're not going to deal with the long-term consequences of that. So you act in ways that you wouldn't act otherwise. Or of course, if I had an unlimited government budget for my agency, That's very different from if I were spending my own money on the same projects. I would be much more careful. I would be much less likely to reward people who are simply loyal to me because I would want people who generate results regardless of what their connection to me is. So moral hazard's a problem. And if you have a monopoly producer of legal tender paper money, then you're going to have some moral hazard because since everybody knows there's no physical limitation on how much additional paper money they can create, as there would be on the creation of physical gold. So therefore, you know that there's no physical constraint on being bailed out in an emergency. If you're a major market actor, you know that there's nothing physically stopping the Fed from bailing you out. The only obstacle is political will, and that's a pretty thin read. Also, fiat money, so what does that mean? That means you're going to behave more recklessly than you would otherwise. Also, fiat money bestows on government far more power than it would have otherwise. Because the government can now raise money for itself in this inconspicuous way of just creating it out of thin air. It can get away with siphoning resources from the citizenry without having to raise taxes or borrow so much that it drives up interest rates for private borrowers. And then that's also noticeable. Both of these means of raising revenue do attract, let's say, public ire. In political calculations, it appears far better to tax the people by this surreptitious means of not allowing prices to fall as they used to do before we had the Fed, and as is the natural trend of prices in a market economy. And in fact, oftentimes having prices rise, that reduces the standard of living of the people. Hardly anybody understands that process. So they just go ahead and do it. Most people can be made to believe that greedy businessmen caused the problem or price gougers or whatever it is. 
Also, fiat money artificially and unjustly increases the wealth and economic power of the banking system well beyond what would occur in the free market. See, ordinary people, you know, you and me, earn money by providing some good or service. And then we take the money that we earn from selling that good or service into the market to acquire the goods and services that you and I want to have for ourselves. Creating money out of thin air allows the money creator to enter the market and just take the things he wants without having first supplied anything himself. So here's what one monetary economist says. The market economy can be understood as a great organism that caters to the needs of consumers as expressed in money payments. When the economy is flooded with legal tender fractional reserve notes, the whole economic body of society begins to cater excessively to the needs of those who control the banking industry. The American economist Frank Fetter once observed that the unhampered market economy resembled a grassroots democratic process, one penny, one market vote. From this point of view, the imposition of fractional reserve notes through legal tender laws creates market votes out of nothing. The bankers and their clients, usually the government in the first place, have many more votes than they would have had in a free society. Now, meanwhile, while other people are being enriched, the average person has to struggle to save. So with your money losing value every year, you'd be ruined if you saved for the future by just piling up paper dollars. Under a precious metal money, people could save for the future by just acquiring gold and silver coins and holding on to them. Now, you could invest that money for even higher returns, but you always had this more conservative option of just holding them. Because back when they circulated as money, they held or increased their value over time. But today, just to maintain, forget about increasing, just to maintain the purchasing power of your savings, you have to become a speculator. You have to navigate your way through the financial markets and just hope the stock market doesn't tumble because there goes your retirement. But there are even more arguments against paper money that can't be redeemed into precious metals. Artificial money creation by a central bank can also influence the business cycle, and I'll have more to say about that maybe in the next episode. Business calculation is undermined when what looks like profits can turn out to be nothing more than a general rise in prices. And then there's the moral argument that no system of fiat money has ever emerged voluntarily. It's always imposed by means of the state's apparatus of compulsion. Now, supporters of fiat money insist that there are beneficial aspects of inflation. And they're going to say things like, if prices were allowed to fall consistently, this would lead to depressed economic conditions. And this would lead to problems for businesses. It would lead to problems for debtors. And so we need the inflation. The inflation actually has salutary effects. Now, there's a lot to say about that, and it has to be said, because the argument that falling prices are bad, that argument is very, very widespread. You even hear some so-called free market people repeating this idea that falling prices are a very, very bad thing. And it really is an NPC opinion. I hope most of you know what an NPC is. It's the kind of opinion that somebody who just wants to go along with the herd will unthinkingly repeat. Deflation is bad. It's like the claim that greedy businessmen are causing inflation. To say deflation is bad is another thing that if you were in charge of the regime, you would want the general public to believe. You would want them to believe that greedy businessmen and price gougers were causing the rise in prices, and you would also want them to believe that a fall in prices would be a devastating thing. So generally what the regime wants to say is that a controlled, moderate inflation is the best thing. When inflation gets really high, they blame greedy businessmen, but they don't want inflation ever to be zero or lower because then they claim that that would be bad for everybody. Actually, it's quite good for everybody, but they want us to think it would be bad so that we'll be content with a stable or slightly increasing price level, or in some cases, a, an even faster increasing price level. But the arguments here are very bad. The arguments they make in favor of inflation as a cure for the supposed horrors of deflation are very bad. And so I'm going to review them, but I think I'm going to review them in the next episode, because I, I, my gosh, have I thrown a lot at you in this particular one. I actually did not plan to spend this much time on these topics, but I think you'll agree with me, this is not the kind of material any of us were taught in school. Certainly, we weren't taught anything about the Federal Reserve. But all we hear in the media, if it is raised, are apologists for the 
Federal Reserve. And of course, by apologists, I don't mean people who say they're sorry. Apologists in the old classical sense of the word, defenders of the Federal Reserve. That's what we hear, excuse making and what kind of a crank are you to oppose our wonderful institutions? That's what we generally get. Now, before we wrap up for today, I want to remind you about something that I've mentioned one other time and that I'd like to say just as a gesture of friendship to a very good guy named Buck Johnson. Some of you may know him. And I want you to know about and check out Buck's podcast, Counterflow. It's the fastest growing podcast in our circles. Buck is a seasoned veteran in the Liberty Movement. He played drums for Jimmy Vaughn at big Ron Paul events in 2008, 2012. So that in itself is pretty great. But now he is the humble host of the Counterflow podcast. He features long form interviews with dissenting voices, which we all love. And he's always counter the typical mainstream regime talking points. He explored lockdown insanity with Jay Bhattacharya, the new right with state rep Anthony Sabatini, and paleo-libertarianism with Jeff Dice, a whole lot more. Always digestible, always concise, always relevant. Sound quality's top-notch. He and I use the same producer. So whether you're a longtime libertarian or a traditional conservative or somebody just waking up now to the insanity of everything around you, check out the Counterflow podcast with Buck Johnson every Tuesday on YouTube and all podcatchers. So if you want to get all of Buck's links, visit counterflowpodcast.com, counterflowpodcast.com. All right, so for my friend Buck Johnson, a little message for you guys. All right, thanks so much for listening, everybody. Let's continue taking the knife to this institution next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.